Hey there, Pastor Adam here. You are watching my weekly online Bible study where we are walking through the entire Bible, seeing how all of Scripture points to Jesus. This week, our session is the provision of peace. We will see that God fights for His people to provide the victory. In just a second, we're going to get to this study, but before we do so, would you please share this video? That way your friends can join us in studying God's Word. Also, Call or text your prayer request to our prayer hotline. The number is 305-707-PRAY. That's 305-707-7729. Okay, here we go. Reportedly, the world has been at peace only 268 of the last 3,400 years. In other words, only 8% of recorded history has known worldwide peace. The 3,100 plus years of war had led, have led to more deaths of anywhere from 150 million to 1 billion people. 108 million of those in the 20th century alone. As of 2018, surveying a wide array of factors, these 13 countries are ranked the most peaceful in the world by the Institute for Peace and Economics. Iceland, New Zealand, Austria, Portugal, Denmark, Canada, Czech Republic, Singapore, Japan, Ireland, Slovenia, Switzerland, and Australia. Why do you think war has been such a large part of human history? Well, the Israelites in the Old Testament, they were no strangers to war either. Abraham, the father of the Israelites, defeated four kings to rescue his nephew Lot. Moses raised his hands, although with a little help, over a battle of self-defense with the Amalekites soon after the Israelites escaped from Egypt. And though they had received no battle training, God's people defeated the Amalekite army. God even commanded the Israelites to war with some of the surrounding peoples, dispensing His judgment and His strength on sinners, not unlike how God would discipline them with foreign nations. In the previous session, the Israelites began their campaign to conquer the Promised Land with a victory over the fortified city of Jericho. Next, the Israelites suffered defeat at the city of Ai because they failed to follow God's instructions. But then they were given victory over that same city after they repented. In this session, we will see that Israel had learned an important lesson. Victory was theirs if they obeyed God, but defeat was certain if they relied upon themselves. Our first point is that God promises victory for His people over their enemies. God promises victory over His pe for His people over their enemies. When the Gibeonites in, in the Promised Land had heard how Jericho and Ai had fallen, they went to visit Joshua and ask for a treaty of peace. But knowing the Israelites' intent to destroy all the peoples of the land, the Gibeonites pretended they had journeyed from far away. Joshua failed to consult God and fell for the ruse. They were, so they were allowed to live as slaves in service to the house of God. But some of other Canaanite kings felt betrayed. Read with me Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. As soon as Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly. Because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, and to Japhia, king of Lashish, to Deborah, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the people with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lashish, the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal in Gilgal, saying, 
Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us as quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. The Israelites could have taken the safe route and stayed home, but they took the truly safe route by keeping their oath and honoring God. An alliance of five kings attacked Gibeon, so they sent word to Joshua for help. Often in their history, Israel had avoided risk and chosen the safe route, even if that route meant departing from God and His ways. But here they kept their oath and marched to defend a people who had tricked them. This was truly the safe route. The previous generation of Israelites often took things into their own hands instead of trusting in God. They had tried to gather more manna than was allowed because they couldn't trust God's provision. They had created a golden calf when Moses was absent for what seemed to be too long. They had refused to go into the promised land because they feared the people of the land would wipe them out. Listen to this quote from Betsy Ten Boom. There are no ifs in God's world and no places that are safer than other places. The center of His will is our only safety. Betsy Ten Boom was the sister of Corey Ten Boom, a survivor of a German concentration camp during World War II. These sisters, along with their father, were Christians who worked to help Jews survive the brutal policies of the Nazis in German-occupied Holland. For their brave efforts, they were arrested and imprisoned like the Jews they tried to save. Betsy and their father both perished in their imprisonment, but their faith and wisdom are recorded in Corey's book, The Hiding Place. Though the Israelites faced a daunting battle, God's first instruction to their leader was not to be afraid. God would give them victory. What appeared from a human perspective to be a great risk and the fallout of Joshua's rash promises was actually God's way of delivering five kings and their armies into Israel's hands. Once again, we see God reminding Joshua that victory was based on who he is and what he would do, not on who the Israelites were and what they could do. Though his situation came about from deception, none of it was outside of God's plan to make good on his promise to give his people to the, land, the people the land. God was going to be glorified even through the trickery of the Gibeonites and the rash promises of Joshua. How is it comforting to know that God can be glorified and bring good from anything, even our mistakes? You know, though we make mistakes, God is not finished with us and continues to use us for His glory and our good. Our struggle with temptation and sin does not disqualify us as sons and daughters of God. And God's eternal promises do not rest on our ability to be perfect in His sight. Our second point is that God fights for His people in miraculous ways. God fights for His people in miraculous ways. Read with me Joshua chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Machadea. And they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent to Beth Horon. The Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Joshar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before, nor since, when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, 
to the camp at Gilgal. When the Israelite army drew near Gibeon, they were worn out. Yes, they had caught the alliance of five kings by surprise, but they had marched all night to do so. Their advantage was lessened by their weakened state, which was exactly what God wanted. He wanted them to remember and to know that He is the Lord who fights on behalf of His people and that He is omnipotent over nations and nature. God's strength is made known clearly through the weaknesses of His people. Notice who acted in these verses. The Lord was the one who threw the opposing armies into confusion. He was the one responsible for the great slaughter of the people's enemies. He was the one who threw large hailstones that killed more enemy soldiers than the sword. God had told Joshua that he would hand the enemy over to the Israelites, and that is precisely what he did. God did not just give his people the victory. He displayed for them and all the people in the land something else quite important. He is omnipotent. Even nature is under his sovereignty, as seen on this occasion in the hailstones he threw in the sun and the moon standing still. This was not a new lesson for the Israelites. They had seen God hold back the waters of the Jordan and they heard the stories of God's mighty works in the Exodus. But this was a lesson that deserved repeating. God wanted his people to trust him and his might, not in themselves. This week's essential doctrine is miracles. A miracle is an event in which God makes an exception to the natural order of things or supersedes natural laws for the purpose of demonstrating His glory and or validating His message. Miracles are recorded throughout Scripture. Miraculous signs and wonders were oftentimes evident where a prophet or an apostle was speaking God's message to the people. Because we believe God to be all-powerful and personally involved in this world, we believe He can and does perform miracles. Joshua knew the battle was the Lord's and that the victory was secure, but he needed more daylight for his forces to see the battle through the, to the end. So he prayed in faith and commanded the sun and moon to halt their march across the sky. And God answered Joshua's prayer. Then the army demonstrated their faith and obedience as they cast aside their exhaustion and kept fighting until the victory was won. You know, we're all fighting battles right now. It might be a physical battle full of sickness or pain, or perhaps an emotional one, and your enemy is depression or anxiety. Perhaps your battle is within your own family. You're fighting for your marriage or the well-being of your children or for the salvation of a loved one. Or your battle might be against yourself, your pride, your ambition, or your own agenda. Regardless of the battle, you must turn away from relying on your own strength to fight. You are not enough. The battle is not yours to win. It is God's to win for you. You won't get through this alone. Instead, turn to the one, only one who can and will get you through the battle and victory. Saturate yourself in His Word and His promises and spend time in His presence and thank Him for His providence. Praise Him for the glory that will be all His. And though you are tired and worn, dare to pray for more sunlight so the fight can wage on until total victory. How does God's omnipotence encourage you in your circumstances? Our last point is that God gives His people land and peace. God gives His people land and peace. While the sun hung on, the Israelites chased down the slaughtered and slaughtered most of the remaining armies, and Joshua captured and killed the five kings. The battle was finally over, but the war was not. The next chapter and a half records with glistening pace how Joshua completed the conquest of both southern and northern Canaan. Then comes the following summary. Read with me, Joshua chapter 11, verse 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. Joshua and the Israelite army entered the promised land near Jericho, about the midpoint as you traveled through the land north to south. In their central campaign, God handed Jericho and Ai over to them. 
The southern campaign involved the defense of Gibeon against the army of five kings and the clearing out of numerous cities in the area. The Israelite army was victorious because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. In Joshua chapter 11, more kings heard of the Israelites' success and mounted armies together and they attacked. And in God's power and providence, Joshua led the Israelites in the northern campaign, which began with victory over an alliance as numerous as the sand that is on the seashore, followed by numerous battles and sieges as the Israelites conquered city after city of their enemies. There are four purposes for this conquest. First, the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Second, fulfillment of God's word to Moses. Third, judgment to, on the sinful nations of Canaan. And fourth, so God would be glorified by the Israelites and in the world. God had promised to give this land to Abraham and to his descendants. And God had told Moses that his people would conquer it and inhabit it. It was his land to give. It did not belong to the nations within it, and to be clear, they were not innocent victims. The Canaanites were idolaters, rebels against God, whom God had given time to repent, but instead they continued in their sin. As long as these people dwelled in the land and God's people were outside of the land, God's glory was veiled. This was why their, their fight was worth it. I mean, though it, it took much time and effort for the Israelites, God made his people victorious and they received their promised land. What are the benefits of perseverance in the faith? We see realizing God's promises, right? We growing in the, the faith and growing in endurance through trials and temptations and demonstrating a bold witness to the goodness and greatness of God. The Israelites had endured a lengthy war and conquest of the promised land, but God had given them victory, and the land was theirs. Then God gave them something else that they desperately needed, peace. Rest for the land ravaged by war. Rest for the battered and worn out bodies and minds of God's people. But the Israelites' physical, emotional, and mental rest in the land was a picture of a greater rest to come for us all the spiritual rest we only find in Jesus. Listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. What will it look like to rest in Christ's victory over sin and death? Well, resting in Christ means that we will endure in hope through the trials and temptations of this age knowing our final victory is coming. We will fight against temptation and sin with confidence of success because Christ has already won our victory. The believer can look at death as falling asleep until the final victory over death results in our resurrection and everlasting rest with God. Just as the people of Israel found themselves in the midst of battles, we as children of God through faith in Jesus and ourselves battling against evil and oppression, sin and temptation, idolatry and destruction. In Christ's army, figuratively speaking, there are no conscious, conscientious objectors, no pacifists. We are all to, called to gear up and get ready for battle. God fought for Joshua and the Israelites, giving them victory. Today, God has provided us victory over sin and death through Jesus' death and resurrection. And we have the peace of God in the midst of a world without peace, just as Jesus promised. But our victory and peace through Christ are not for us alone. We are called to share Jesus with all who will listen so they too might experience His victory and peace. Because Christ fought the battle against sin and death and won the victory through his life and death and resurrection, we proclaim him to others so they too may find peace through him. Here are some ways that you can apply God's word to your life this week. How will you rest in the victory and peace Christ has won for us through his life, death, and resurrection? What are some ways your friends can encourage you to stay in the fight against temptation and sin with God's strength for the victory. This week, 
How will you point someone to the victory and peace found through faith in Jesus Christ? Please pray with me. Father, you are the God who fights for his people's salvation and rest. We are in awe at the power you display in conquering our enemies and are grateful for the grace you extend to us in allowing us to share in your victory. Help us to trust in you as the God who goes before us. We thank you most of all for fighting for us in your Son, Jesus, through whose life, death, and resurrection our greatest enemies in Satan, sin, and death have been defeated. May we move forward in mission in the strength of your Holy Spirit, proclaiming Christ's reign to the nations so they may believe in him for the victory and peace with you. Amen. Thank you so much for watching my Bible study. What did you think? I would love to hear your thoughts. So please comment on this video. Remember, God fights for his people to provide the victory. If you have not given your life to Christ, please do so today. All you need to do is admit your need, that you are a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. Two, be willing to turn from trusting in anything else for eternal life and only in Christ. Three, believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, came back to life from the grave, and is the, your only way to heaven. And four, receive Jesus' offer to forgive your sins and to come into your life as your Savior. If God is leading you to do so, would you pray a prayer similar to, to this? Dear Jesus, thank you for making it possible for me to find peace with God. I believe that when you died, you were paying the penalty for my sins. I now receive you into my life as my Savior so I can have forgiveness and never-ending life from God. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Amen. If you prayed this prayer and meant it, please reach out to me. You can call or text our prayer hotline. It's 305-707-PRAY. That's 305-707-7729. Or you can send me an email, adam at adamburton.net. I hope you all have an amazing week, and Lord willing, I will see you next week for our online Bible study. God bless.